There are few periods in history studied like the first centuries before and after Jesus of Nazareth. What was the world this man would have lived in historically? This question is rife with controversy and not always for good reasons. There are two billion Christians till this day and a long lineage of writings and saints and mixed religious ideas that played into the religion's origins. A milieu of comparative intellects and mystics who lived in the times of the Alexandrian and Ephesus libraries and under that great philosophical shadow of Plato and Pythagoras, which admittedly influenced the theology of early Christian fathers and the rest of Christian theology ever since. But most Christians, I would dare say, have never tried to put their early writings in historical context, never mind to consider the life of Christ in that context. Prior to this monumental point in history, the old gods and myths existed for thousands of years. Basic theologies had been refined and changed by philosophical movements. And in Jesus' day, too, there would have been thousands of pertinent scrolls to read and traditions to learn from all across the Mediterranean, if in fact he could read them or get his hands on them. Now, depending on the mind behind the Christian literature produced in the first centuries following the life of Christ, there was a great variety to the message. There were extremes, and also some narrow-minded definitions to sort out before the Christian doctrine could be agreed upon by the various church leaders. And there were the Gnostics, except they didn't all refer to themselves by this name. This is rather a designation of their beliefs. The Gnostic movement was not a religion itself. Though it is intimately bound to the coming of Jesus Christ, its literary tradition deviates from the accepted gospel at many instances. Because, of course, early Christianity was a wide spectrum of sects and churches who each referenced their own peculiar scriptures, some of which were included later in the Bible that we know today and some that were not. So Christianity was hardly a singular tradition in the first few centuries or ever since. The literature related to Jesus and somewhat awkwardly bound to the Hebrew texts took centuries to approach any canonization by the time the Bishop of Alexandria, Athanasius, cemented the New Testament writings in the order we read them today. This happened around 367 AD, and the New Testament texts, including the already canonized Gospels, were further solidified among the churches after Athanasius's 39 festal letter for Easter. Among the followers of Jesus and the later interpreters of his message were many schools later given the title of Gnostics, which like the Cathars is a title serving to distinguish their beliefs from the biblical Christians we're familiar with. And so we have the lineage from the disciple of St. Paul's private teachings, a teacher named Theodos, who instructed Valentinus in Alexandria. Now Valentinus, born in Egypt, was an early Christian mystic and a poet who placed his focus on the mystical knowledge of God, the true knowledge of God, or Gnosis. Valentinus is said to have witnessed a risen Christ in a vision and became a Christian teacher in Alexandria around 120 AD, achieving a large following and moving to Rome 16 years later where he was lauded so much that in 143 AD he was a candidate for the office of bishop and possibly refusing this, taught in Rome for another decade. His death some unknown years later did not stop his followers from disseminating his teachings in Rome, where Ptolemy and Heraclian taught, in Alexandria where Theodotus taught, and in Antioch under Axionicus. The followers of Valentinus did not refuse Catholic congregations in the 2nd and 3rd centuries, and it's not clear that they ever intended to become a separate church. But in 326 AD, Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire, and there were movements against the so-called heretics. Of course, the Roman Empire and Emperor Constantine now saw how Christianity could be a tool for power never mind what earlier Christians were persecuted by the same empire. Even so, the teachings of Valentinus endured in esoteric circles 
up until the 9th century, and he was not the only one to create or inherit a significant movement that would seek to redefine many theological concepts associated with Christianity. Basilides was also an early Christian teacher, teaching at Alexandria from 117 to 138 AD, and he claimed the inheritance of the apostle St. Matthias, or from a hearer of St. Peter named Glaucius. He is said to have founded a school of Gnosticism based on these secret teachings, and his followers were known later as the Basilideans. It is possible that Basilides studied with Valentinus and was probably a pupil of Menander in Antioch. Along with his Psalms and Odes, Basilides wrote commentaries on the Gospels and also compiled a Gospel, which we have but fragments of. The Christian theologian Clement of Alexandria, as well as Hippolytus of Rome and St. Irenaeus, give different accounts of Basilides. Basilides was succeeded by his son Isidor, and his school still existed in Egypt in the 4th century. The essential Gnostic beliefs centered around the Creator God, spiritual salvation, and the correct life and practice of the believer. For the Gnostic, generally, there must be a pathway of material denial, and in some cases, asceticism, which may lead the individual to gnosis, or the true knowledge of God, which even non-Gnostic Christians sought. The Gnostic fundamental teachings are that the world is an illusion, and to despise the mundane and material world, and that matter is inherently evil and the world is dualistic. They portrayed a somewhat elitist and exclusivist knowledge related to the Hebrew God and Creator in the Old Testament, Yahweh. But it wasn't until the shocking finding of the Nag Hammadi Library in Nag Hammadi, Egypt, in the 1940s and later in the 70s when the Gnostic texts received their due attention. This series of discovered texts demonstrated more nuanced perspectives carried through the centuries by the Valentinian Christians, 13 codices as they are called, which would appear to be the study materials of an Egyptian. Many of the texts are dated to the first centuries AD. To put that in context, we find most of the New Testament scriptures being compiled and composed from 50 to about 150 AD. The Nag Hammadi texts were found in Upper Egypt in December 1945, months after the Axis surrendered in World War II. This town at the Jabal al-Tarif is a mountain honeycomb of over 150 caves with thousands of years of history as an Egyptian gravesite. It was 30 years after their discovery that the man who found the text told the story of what happened. Muhammad Ali al-Saman and his brothers were digging for a soft soil used for farming, and they struck a jar as they were digging around a boulder. Wondering if it might contain gold, Muhammad broke open the jar and took home the 13 papyrus books bound in leather, dumping these near his oven. His mother unfortunately used some of the papyrus to kindle the fire of that oven. Weeks later, Muhammad says that he and his brothers took brutal revenge on their father's murderer, apparently consuming the murderer's own heart after the killing was done. And later, feeling that the authorities would search his house and find the books, Muhammad gave some to a local priest, who gave one to a local history teacher, where it later got in the black market of Cairo's antique dealers. Somehow, the Egyptian authorities caught word of this and later confiscated the majority of the 13 codices, even though one had been smuggled out of Egypt and offered for sale in America. Scholars who slowly and incredulously got their hands on the text would have been confronted by claims that these books contained the secret teachings of Jesus, and that Jesus had a lover, Mary Magdalene, who he often kissed in front of the other disciples, and that Judas, in fact, did not betray Jesus, but sold him out due to Jesus' own plan. Now, for the dating of the original texts in the Nag Hammadi library, we are hard-pressed to consider them more recent than 120 to 150 AD. And as the Bishop of Lyons, Irenaeus, writing in 180 AD, said about the heretics of his time, who, quote, boast that they possess more Gospels than there really are, 
Gospels already in circulation from Gaul through Rome, Greece, and Asia Minor. Now, I won't be demonstrating every point where these Gnostic texts deviate from Orthodox Christian scriptures. For the purposes of this video, we will, for the time being, investigate their contrary views on cosmology. Let us then visit one of the unnamed texts found in Nag Hammadi, appropriately called On the Origin of the World, which contains a medley of beliefs, pulling, it seems, from Greek, Egyptian, and Jewish ideas, perhaps a bit of Zoroastrian influence sprinkled here or there as well. The text stands in strong disagreement with Orthodox Christians about the nature of the Jewish Creator God as given in Genesis and throughout the Old Testament. We read as follows, quote, Seeing that everybody, gods of the world and mankind, says that nothing existed prior to chaos, I, in distinction to them, shall demonstrate that they are all mistaken, because they are not acquainted with the origin of chaos, nor with its root. How well it suits all men on the subject of chaos to say that it is a kind of darkness, but in fact it comes from a shadow, which has been called by the name darkness. And the shadow comes from a product that has existed since the beginning. It is, moreover, clear that it existed before chaos came into being. After the natural structure of the immortal beings had completely developed out of the infinite, a likeness then emanated from pistis, faith. It is called Sophia, wisdom. It exercised volition and became a product resembling the primeval light, and immediately her will manifested itself as a likeness of heaven, having an unimaginable magnitude. It was between the immortal beings and those things that came into being after them. Like she, Sophia, functioned as a veil dividing mankind from the things above. Now the eternal realm, or aeon, of truth has no shadow outside it, for the limitless light is everywhere within it. But its exterior is shadow, which has been called by the name darkness. From it there appeared a force presiding over the darkness, and the forces that came into being subsequent to them called the shadow the limitless chaos. From it every kind of divinity sprouted up, together with the entire place so that also shadow is posterior to the first product. It was in the abyss that it appeared, deriving from the aforementioned pistis. To summarize the rest of the account, the shadow came to existence out of a vast watery substance and became aware of something greater than itself and envied it, spawning jealousy throughout the eternal realms and with its bile creating the watery substance of all places and matter came forth from the chaos and the watery substance and dwelled within it. Then Sophia appeared above the chaos and the bottomless water, and was disturbed upon seeing her defected child, who existed below all the heavens. When Sophia decided for spiritless chaos to have a ruler to preside over matter, out of the waters an androgynous ruler came forth, ignorant of his origins. And Sophia called out as he moved in the waters and said, Child, pass through here. The child was named Yaldabaoth, which becomes the Gnostic equivalent to the god of Genesis, Jehovah or Yahweh. This initial speech from Sophia resulted in the creation of the angels and mankind. And Yaldabaoth was not yet aware of Sophia and could not see her, but only the reflection of her on the water. And he had the likeness of a lion. Once Sophia sees that he rules over matter, she withdraws into the light. But Yaudabaoth saw only himself in the darkness and the water, and thought that he existed alone. Through his speech he moved over the waters and divided them, then divided the earth from heaven and made the earth. And Yaudabaoth speaks into being his three sons, Yeo, Eloi, and Astaphios. And next the seven androgynous forces of the seven heavens of chaos appeared in the chaos but resembled the immortality of Sophia and would affect the world to let the light reign in the end. There comes a point when the earth and the heavens consolidate that Yaldabaoth becomes full of himself and claims that he is the god of all things. But Sophia appears and names him a blind god and tells him of a being who is born of the light and will appear and pound him like a potter pounds clay, eventually abolishing all of his defections. Sophia then gifts him a bit of her own light, and Yaudabaoth hates his father and mother, the darkness and the abyss from which he was born, 
and the other creatures of chaos mounted to wage war against him, to which Sophia supplies angels, and a great war in the heavens proceeds. Now perhaps the most important cosmological work of the Gnostic tradition, for want of a better phrase, is the Apocryphon of John, or the Secret Book of John, written under the name of the same John in Revelation and John the Apostle. Now, there are careful studies related to this text, and there is a lot that goes into its context, dating, and the school of thought surrounding its propagation. But without dwelling on the particulars at the moment, let's set up the premise of the text. One day, John comes up to the temple, and a Pharisee, which is a member of an ancient Jewish sect, approaches John and asks where his teacher is, the one he followed. John says that Jesus had returned from whence he came, and the Pharisee claims that Jesus deceived him, turning him from the teachings of his ancestors. John becomes stressed at these accusations and seeks out a private place in the mountains and asks, How was the Savior selected? Why was he sent into the world by his Father? Who is his Father who sent him? To what kind of eternal realm shall we go? And what was he saying when he told us, This eternal realm to which you will go is modeled after the incorruptible realm? but he did not teach us what kind of realm that one is. In quoting from the Meyer translation, we read, At the moment I was thinking about this, look, the heavens opened, all creation under heaven lit up, and the world shook. I was afraid, and look, I saw within the light a child standing by me. As I was staring, it seemed to be an elderly person. Again it changed its appearance to be a youth. Not that there were several figures before me, Rather, there was a figure with several forms within the light. These forms appeared through each other, and the figure had three forms. This figure, who is the risen Savior, asks John why does he fear and doubt, saying he is the father, the mother, and the child, and has come to teach John of the truth of what is, has been, and will be, and what will come of the perfect race of mankind. He tells John to teach this to his spiritual friends, and he instructs him first about the one God, who is sovereign and above all, being of a pure light that no one can gaze upon. He says not to think of it like God or as a God, because it cannot be defined by any limited means, and it needs nothing at all, and lacks nothing, because all things are comprised of it and come forth from it. The one God is therefore unutterable. Quote, the one is not corporeal and is not incorporeal. The one is not large and is not small. It is impossible to say how much is it, what kind is it, for no one can understand it. And later we read that the one, quote, reflects on his image everywhere, sees it in the spring of the spirit, and becomes enamored of his luminous water. For his image is in the spring of pure luminous water surrounding him. The father's thought became a reality, and she who appeared in the presence of the father in shining light came forth. She is the first power who preceded everything and came forth from the Father's mind as the forethought of all. And Sophia from the powers of God is anointed with mind, and with mind wishes to create with the invisible word of the Spirit. And this Holy Spirit brings forth a divine child to sit beside it in heaven. But Sophia also wished to create something without the consent of the Spirit, and does so without a partner. Quote, And something came out of her that was imperfect and different in appearance from her, for she had produced it without her partner. It did not resemble its mother and was misshapen. When Sophia saw what her desire had produced, it changed into the figure of a snake with the face of a lion. Its eyes were like flashing bolts of lightning. She cast it away from her, outside that realm, so that none of the immortals would see it. She had produced it ignorantly. Then Sophia hides it away and names it Yaldabaoth, who becomes the first ruler and is far away from the place he was born. And with some measure of mindlessness, Yaldabaoth produces the planets and the rulers of the lower realm, and the sun, and the years, and the days of the week, who are, as we saw in the Persian and the Babylonian account, seen as evil spirits, or otherwise divinities, who are imperfect and born with a greater measure of chaos. But Yaudabaoth models his creation off of the first perfect realm, saying, When the angels and his creation surrounded him, I am a jealous God, and there is no other God beside me. But by announcing this, he suggested to the angels with him 
that there is another God. For if there were no other God, of whom would he be jealous? Now here is where the Gnostic begins to define the God of the Hebrew books of Moses with Yaudabaoth, and the writer of the Apocryphon of John engages in further dialogue with the spirit that came to him. And the spirit explains, This is when the mother began to move around, out of agitation that her creations lack an important value. Then the spirit laughs at John's questions and tells John, Do not suppose that it is, as Moses said, above the waters. No, when she recognized the wickedness that had occurred and the robbery her son had committed, she repented. And Sophia cries and was thenceforth stationed at the ninth heaven above her ill-made offspring until Yadabaoth achieves what was lacking in him from the beginning. Then from the highest heaven a voice is heard, which Yadabaoth thinks is his mother's voice. The voice pronounces the creation of the fifth human, and Yadabaoth sees the reflection of this creation on the water, and, quote, Yadabaoth said to the authorities with him, Come, let us create a human being after the image of God and with a likeness to ourselves, so that this human image may give us light. This is reminiscent of the hour in the book of Genesis, when God, or the Elohim, say, Let us create man in our image. And so they created a man in the image of the perfect human that they saw in the reflection, and named it Adam. And it is in this text also that seven powers create the different parts of Adam. And a host of angels finish him with a variety of appendages and features, like the legs, fingernails, shoulders, and so on. And in the text we read of the angels and the demons who have power of desire, pleasure, dryness, wetness, and so forth. And Sophia then prays for this creation and intervenes so that Adam might take a share of her likeness. And Yaudabaoth, on the orders of her angels, breathes life into Adam. However, the spirit that came into him was that of Sophia, but Yaudabaoth does not know this on consequence of his ignorance. And once Adam moves, he is illuminated and becomes the victim of jealousy of the other powers of Yaudabaoth, because he is more powerful than they are and can think more clearly. And so the powers of Yaudabaoth cast Adam into the lowest material realm, not knowing that Adam yet contained the light that Sophia was lacking in her creation, and that Adam contained the seed that would eventually restore the ill-made creation of Sophia. And so the seven powers of Yaudabaoth continue to set themselves against Adam, and Adam becomes the first mortal, the first being to be estranged from his heavenly abode. But locked within him is the afterthought bestowed by Sophia that would vitalize him. And so Adam was placed in paradise by the rulers, who instructed him to eat and take pleasure. But they blocked Adam's vision from the tree of life that sat in the middle of paradise. Now the spirit, who is the same as the risen Christian savior in this text, teaches John the true story. John asks, however, if it was the serpent who induced Adam to eat. The Spirit says that it was he who instructed Adam to eat, not the serpent, but says them as if Adam was not one being but multiple beings. And somewhat in a contradiction, the Savior or Spirit tells John that the snake did bid Adam to eat, quote, of the wickedness of sexual desire and destruction so that Adam might be of use to the snake. This is the one who knew Adam was disobedient because of the enlightened afterthought within Adam which made Adam stronger of mind than the first ruler. The first ruler wanted to recover the power that he himself had passed on to Adam, so he brought deep sleep upon Adam. And John asks about this sleep, and the Spirit tells him that it is not how Moses told it, but that Adam lost his senses because the first ruler intended to, quote, make their minds sluggish, that they may neither understand nor discern. But still the light of Sophia had herself hidden within Adam, and Yaudabaoth wanted to take her from Adam and pursued her, but could not apprehend her. Quote, the first ruler removed part of Adam's power and created another figure in the form of a female, like the image of afterthought that had appeared to him. He put the part he had not taken from the power of the human being into the female creature. It did not happen, however, the way Moses said, Adam's rib. And so Adam sees this woman at his side, and immediately the enlightened afterthought removes the clouds that blocked his mind from the truth. Adam recognizes her as one with his bones and flesh, 
Sophia had descended in the form of Eve, therefore to restore in her creation what was lacking. And the Savior tells John, quote, As for me, I appeared in the form of an eagle on the tree of knowledge, which is the afterthought of the pure enlightened forethought, that I might teach the human beings and awaken them from the depth of sleep. For the two of them were fallen and realized that they were naked, afterthought appeared to them as light and awakened their minds. And then Yaudabaoth, the first ruler, proceeds as the god in Genesis and casts Adam and Eve from paradise, and they were fearful to denounce him. Afterward, Yaudabaoth perceives what power Eve had locked within her, and he defiles her, bearing two sons who are interestingly Elohim and Yahweh, who are both names of God in the Old Testament. These sons become Cain and Abel, and sexual intercourse persists because of Yaudabaoth's defilement of Eve and his seeding of the false spirit into humanity. But when Adam understood the afterthought as a counterpart to his foreknowledge, he produces his son, called Seth, and the human beings were thereafter made by the first ruler to drink the waters of forgetfulness, so that they would not know where they came from. And so the struggle between Sophia and her firstborn Yaudabaoth persists. The spirit of life may descend upon those who act according to good deeds, but the spirit of evil would ascend upon those who can be led astray. And so the spirit of the Savior proceeds to instruct John on where the soul will travel upon death, and the soul is decidedly feminine in her capacity as a part of Sophia. And further on, the spirit explains how the angels of Yaudabaoth just like the fallen angels in the book of Enoch, descended upon the daughters of mankind and defiled them for their pleasure. At first this was unsuccessful, but trying again they succeeded and planted in mankind many deceits and desires that led them astray. And after the Savior defines himself and submits the destiny of mankind to John, he tells John to guard against the evil angels of Yaudabaoth and to beware of the deep sleep of the senses, And Jesus reascends to the perfected realm, leaving John to spread the message of what the risen Savior spoke to him. Once more we are confronted with a tragedy at the start of creation, and a dualism embedded in the material realm at the beginning. And the signature theme of this conflict plays into the creation of the universe, the gods, the earth, and mankind. The Gnostics believed that this world could not have been created without such a tragedy, and perhaps utilized the broad scope of teachings around them to wrestle with the themes of cosmology they crafted. How could a humanity born of a purely loving and enlightened God plummet so far into forgetfulness and misery without some kind of explanation? But it's not that the Gnostics were claiming something too extraordinary, for they believed as much as the normal Christian believed that Jesus resurrected in spiritual form. However, the Gnostics teach that the risen Savior allegedly instructed his disciples while in his spiritual form. This version of Jesus takes on a trinity, not so much the confounding and perhaps adulterated holy trinity of modern Christians, which is fairly redundant, but the Apocryphon of John presents a trinity of father, mother, and son, the obvious trinity that imitates the creative power of God. Yaudabaoth, much like the Zoroastrian god Ahriman, is ever at work to thwart some aspect of Sophia's creation and takes on the form of a snake at times, as we have seen with Tiamat, the Egyptian Set, the Greek Python, and Ahriman, and many of the mythological embodiments of evil and opposition. It is important to note that this Gnostic teaching does not present a hopeless situation, but is decidedly dualistic about it. It recognizes in humanity two aspects with opposing intentions. As we read in the Gnostic text titled The Apocalypse of Adam, quote, God, the ruler of the realms and the powers, divided us in wrath, and then we became two beings, and the glory in our hearts left us, me and your mother Eve, along with the first knowledge that breathed in us. So the Gnostics separate from the Hebrew narrative to showcase a secret teaching of Jesus, a gnosis of his disciples that the common Christians were told by many church authorities to denounce as heresy. And by the Gnostic writer of the secret book of John, we are told the story didn't always go as Moses put it in the books of Genesis. A particular Gnostic text titled the Gospel of Judas, for instance, 
paints Judas, the betrayer, in a new light. It says Judas was not only supposed to betray Jesus, but would do so under the instruction of Jesus himself. What else is interesting about some of these writings is the mystical, visionary experiences that seem to be at the foundation of them. John, or the writer assuming the name of John, tells us that the heavens opened up and all creation under heaven lit up. Also in the Nag Hammadi text titled The Paraphrase of Shem, we find Shem having a mystical experience before a voice began to instruct him on the accurate cosmology. The writer presents the experience as follows, quote, My thought, which was in my body, snatched me away from my race. It took me up to the top of the world, which is close to the light that shone upon the whole area there. I saw no earthly likeness, but there was light, and my thoughts separated from the body of darkness as though in sleep. We should not discount these mystical visions offhand, seeing as the Apostle Paul also credits a vision of Jesus as his point of revelation, same as Valentinus. We know from the records of -of out-of-body, near-death, or psychedelic experiences in modern times that people report leaving their bodies, encountering an all-loving light, or a religious figure like Jesus, or a spiritual guide who instructs and enters a dialogue with them. The Apocryphon of John and the text titled The Origin of the World and the Paraphrase of Shem are not the only Gnostic texts that report a cosmological teaching. There is the hypostasis of the archons and the apocalypse of Adam. As you read these texts, you begin to see how complex the Gnostic systems were. And if you review the accounts of the Nascenes, as reported by Hippolytus, you find another heretical sect utilizing a diverse range of mythological traditions and the names of gods that are used to support their theology. We should always bear in mind, therefore, that in the first centuries of the Christian followers, There were a range of beliefs, influenced at the local and the foreign level and stemming from the students of different apostles. Many of these texts translate beautifully in English and offer any student of theology alternative perspectives that in the early stages of Christianity weren't as primed with controversy as they later became when the Roman Empire established it as their state religion and a succession of councils and began to influence which scriptures supported their narrative. Gnostics like Valentinus and Basilides lived in Alexandria at a time when many of the known world's beliefs were fusing and students could select from them to construct their own beliefs. You had mysterious figures living around this time like Simon Magus, Hermes Trismegistus, and Apollonius of Tiana, attributed with magic and sorcery, and in the case of Apollonius, miracles on par with those worked by Jesus. In the ancient world, the gods were known to work through enlightened mystics and heroes to bring teachings to mankind. And in this sense, Jesus of Nazareth isn't some abrupt figure that had no parallels in history, but rather embodied an expected return of a savior, like the Zoroastrian Seoshant, who would be the final savior of the world. So keeping in mind that in the first century the first Christians numbered all too few and that this period contained a collection of various interpretations, we have built another column for our little temple of cosmology and look forward to a review of the Orphic and the Hermetic cosmologies to come. Consider supporting the channel through the Patreon link below in the description where you can watch new videos ad free and download some free ebooks of rare texts. Until next time, see you soon.